Good evening. Um, so I'm here tonight to talk a little bit about the, well, the talk is titled The Open Source Silicon Ecosystem, or The Open Source Silicon Design Ecosystem. And I'm going to start talking about that, but then I guess I'll get into the foundation and why we were formed and what it is we aim to do. But I'll give you a bit of a background first. Um, or rather a bit of an overview of the talk first. So I, I'm sure people have been around doing this longer than me, but uh, I think we really started with having open source designs and RTL downloadable from the internet in the, the early noughties. So you had open cores start up in about 1999 with the original team, and then it went from there. So I'll talk a little bit about what it was like then, what it's like today, and, and as you heard from Al, it's, um, it's pretty encouraging. There's some amazing stuff out there. Um, but then I'll talk about why I think it's not good enough and why I think we could do more and why, where I think it could go. So a brief introduction about me. Um, I've been involved in the Open Risk Project since 2008, although these days I don't really do much coding and that's partly because work keeps me very busy and also work told me not to. Um, so I just organised the, the beer. But I'm a digital d design engineer and through my involvement with the community I've, I've been involved in the startup of the Free and Open Source Silicon Foundation, or FOSSI as we uh, abbreviate it to. Talking about the bad old days, um, that's really all we had. Un unless you used vendor tools and a version of Model Sim, uh, you couldn't, there wasn't a lot available other than Icarus and Wilson Snyder's Veripool tools. So Wilson Snyder is responsible for, if you didn't know, Emacs mode in, Ver in sorry, Ver Verilog mode in Emacs and Vera later, later on. I'm not quite sure what year that was released, but that would have been nearly 10 years ago, I guess. 99, is that when it started? 94, 96, Oh, okay. I see. All right. So a little while, but you know, he, he's been there forever. And then Open Cores as well, which I'm sure most of you are aware of. And the, you know, I'm only mentioning microprocessors here, like the Open Risk and the Leon Spark. I'm sure there were others. But of course, you, you also had to think about things like Microblaze and Neos, which were getting used regularly both in academia and in, in industry back then. And there were no open source tools. OK, oh, I've just mentioned a couple of simulators, but there was nothing serious for verification or synthesis. So if you look at where we are today and, and where things have gone in the last, I guess, 15 years, it, it is remarkable. Um, you've got, first of all, the, the one making a lot of news at the moment is the RISC-V architecture, which has come out of Berkeley. And that really, you know, that being involved in the Open RISC project, we knew that the architecture that we were using was quite old. Spark is quite old. There wasn't really anything out there which was doing things that people wanted, like improving code density with a mixed 1632-bit instruction set and addressing architectural issues that allow you to improve, you know, allow you to uh, feasibly achieve superscalar implementations and, and or you know address the super low end deeply embedded stuff. So we think Risk Five does that and does it quite well. And and I'm quite happy that it's. I'm very pleased to see that it's backed by. They've got their own foundation now. They've got money. They've got corporate sponsors who are getting involved to I guess help guide the architecture. From that project, or rather, I'm not quite sure what whether that's caused these other things. But the low risk project, I'm sure many of you are aware of. And that's, that's um, very, very cool, very encouraging to see that there was somebody and, and, and some groups of people who are keen to put their money behind making a truly open source SOC that is going to be sold to hobbyists. Uh, that Goblin Core 64, I only found that today. That's actually a, a sort of big data high data throughput processing extension to the RISC-V architecture, which is being done at Texas Tech. Um, there's a few other things on there which are modern, you know, contemporary projects which have been, had a lot of work put into them and been released as well. And I'll talk a, a bit later about, I think, why we also need to get academia involved a little bit more in this, because a lot of projects happen. A lot of fantastic work goes on in academia. 
and then the guys graduate, they disappear, no one touches it again, it sits on a server. Um, we're lucky if it's, you know, we can Google and, and track it down, but most of the time I think this stuff never sees the light of day, despite the fact that a lot of uh, universities' IP contracts would allow it to be released under open source license. So as Al mentioned before this, <laughs> Clifford again, and his work is, is remarkable, I think, in, tr in finally open sourcing a, a tool chain. You know, for many years we were complaining about the Xilinx and Altera tools of the world, again, taking up a terabyte each, and then um, things crash, you're not quite sure what's going on. So that's, that's really a breath of fresh air. Of course, you know, things like Verilator and Icarus have continued to be developed. Um, supporting newer versions of Verilog. And then there's been a, a load of Python-based EDA that's, that's come along as well. So Sebastian, I don't quite know how to say his last name, it's Border Q or something. Uh, his work with the Milky Mist project, which then led into, sort of caused him to go and make some Python-based HDL tools. Um, and then SOC generation tools as well, which are quite impressive. Chris Higgs and Stu's Coco TB, which we've heard about before at Oshog, that's a, that's a very, very cool tool, enabling basically Verilog test bench access from, from Python. So that's very useful, um, quite powerful. And then we've got build flow package management IP with Fuse SOC. Uh, and of course, there's, I'm sure there's many other tools that I've missed here which, which have you know, come about. But you, you do see things like this being used in the main these days with sort of hobbyist, small industry uh, level digital design. So that's good. So too the, the, the licensing. So we, we've had the solder pad license come along which is a permissive Apache based, seemingly lawyer, lawyer approved and, and vetted license which is what we need. Um, also CERN as well have, have paid a load of lawyers to go and look at a reciprocal um, license. Which, which is definitely useful. And then my own little one, the OHDL there, which was MPL based and it's a bit of a find and replace job. But uh, you know, in spirit, I, it's a file level based copyright license. So in 10 years ago, we didn't have these. 10 years ago, everyone was using the LGPL or the GPL, which to me seems like madness because they're explicitly software licenses being applied to hardware designs. I didn't think that worked. Um, so I'm, it's very pleasing to see that there are hardware centric licenses out and about these days. So I think in summary we, we've definitely come a long way in the last you know 10-15 years and it's encouraging to see what is out there and what is being used. Um, I'm sure many of you have come across some of these fantastic turnkey FPGA kits you can get now. I mean the I'm not sure if one is available from the RISC-V community but effectively you can you know Download a blob, buy a board, press a few buttons, put it on, boot Linux, and to me that seems quite powerful. And of course, you know the, uh, the community is growing, and that's great, and it, you know that's very encouraging. But I still think there's there's something more to do in this area, and that was the conclusion uh, a few of us came to a couple of years ago, somewhat spurred on or spurred on by by Jeremy telling us that something had to be done and and uh, being involved in probably the last gasps of open cause's old owners trying to make something of it. Um, yeah, it's, it's still not a completely rosy picture, I think, with, with the way the community has gone, and, and or rather, with the lack of serious sort of groups and, and organizations. You know, as I said, there's some fantastic hobbyists and small industry guys who are doing incredible work. But what I think remains is something to pull it all together and, and something to, to coalesce all of the, the great work that goes on and the, the various communities and academia projects that occur to, um, to bring it together to make a, something that's greater than some of the parts in a way. So that's, that's what a few of us um, behind the Fossey Foundation thought, or probably all of us, actually. So we formed this, I think, late last year, and it's a community interest company here in the UK. 
but we've got directors all around Europe who, are, who have been involved primarily from the Open Risk Project um, for the last 10, 15 years. So the idea is that um, we're going to do a few things. First of all, is supplant open cores with Libra cores. Um, open cores made a few mistakes, I think, with the way that they enforced a registration model. They, you know, they they had a few concepts which didn't quite work. Uh, however, we think that you know, with sufficient community in, um, input and and our own experience, we can we can do something better. And for instance. I'll, I'll get into to Libra calls a little bit more, but the idea is you don't want somebody to host all your projects. You don't want to be a source forge or something. You, you want to be more like a, an IP digest or, or, a, or a listing. So you go along, look, what you, look for what you're after, a CPU, a crypto core. We'll have a link to where it is on, on GitHub or the, the source hosting that's popular with those developers, right? But as well, have it as a place which, which will host um, best practices guidelines. Um, you know, be a be a focal point for the for the community to come and and the place where they share their IP, the place where they know they'll get eyeballs, the place where they know they'll be found. And so the idea is that you'll get academia, hobbyists, and and hopefully small industry. I, I'm not quite sure how we're going to handle the the um, the case of perhaps someone who's selling commercial cores coming and putting like a shareware version on there. Maybe that's okay. I don't know. We'll cross that bridge when we come to it. But but the idea is that it will be there for people to basically list their IP to make it easy to find. Because at the moment, you've got fragmentation. Everybody is in their own corner of GitHub or, or whatever their um, repository management system is, and you can't find it. I mean, you have to be very lucky to stumble upon some of these projects sometimes, and the IP is great, and it should be out there, and it should be reused. So we're all about encouraging reuse. Um, as I mentioned as well, the, I think Licensing in this field is, is quite important, and I think we need to encourage people to understand the virtues of, of the different licenses, and of, of course provide a like a, a list of those. and And we have a little bit of a on, if you go to the Fossey Foundation website. In fact, I think there should be a link at the end. I'd, we r would be remiss of me to not put a link to the foundation on here. But uh, uh, if you go there, you'll find a little bit of a summary of the current state of of licensing in, in the the digital design world at the moment. Of course, we're all about drinking beer as well, so the idea is that we'll get people together each year. We've been doing that in Europe so far. We'd like to perhaps ex expand that um, around the world and, and you know, foster all of the communities that exist wherever they are. We started, we, we've applied for Google Summer of Code funding this year and I think we got a few places. Yeah, f three places. Um, I couldn't tell you what the projects, what the work that's getting funded is off the top of my head, but uh, it's good stuff. It's, it's fantastic to see Google um, supporting us. We're also running our own student design contest, which is worth mentioning here. So I believe the idea is you have to submit by the end of August, and it has to be something to do with open source digital design. It doesn't have to be IP. It could be tools. It could be flows. Um, there's more information about that on the, on the foundation page as well. Actually, maybe that's on the Libra course page, but you'll find it. I'll get to it a bit later, but I do think as well getting industry involved in this area is, is important, you know, be it small or big industry. I do think that's how the open source software movement got, got a lot of momentum and, you know, got their critical mass to, to play such a big role that they do now in, in, industri in industry and, um, and, you know, hobbyists' lives. We also got a bit of a manifesto. The idea is that we want to support and, and champion open standards and design reuse. That's the idea. And then, of, of course, expose, well, bring more visibility to, to academia projects. So what's on LibreCores at the moment is some documentation, some getting started, best practices stuff. Um, we've also got a bit of a, bl a blog planet on there, which, which I'm sure we could um, add more things to to, to um, make it more relevant. And then, of course, the, the project and IP repository that I mentioned is still a bit of a work in progress. So at the end of the day, I think what we want to achieve is, you know, something that, that resembles a modern day open source software repository, something that has a lot of stuff that's relevant um, or, is, or is finished and mature and is there and you know it's there and you can go and get it and you can reference it. Um, and 
as I mentioned before, I think industry is important to get involved here. I think it's a bit of a build it and they will come sort of idea. Maybe not entirely, but uh, I think that if you, if you show a, a model that is, um, or if you demonstrate a model that is usable by industry where they can come along and they can contribute bits of IP and they're not worried about you know, reciprocal licensing or, or being sued or, or something because somebody knows their microarchitecture. If you can somehow get them involved, I think you're going to see a, a, a big swell in, in the, the sort of amount of participation we're going to get in this field. Uh, and obviously everybody benefits from that. And we'd like to see progression in, in the way that people develop and release and verify their cause. So that's all part of addressing the quality of the stuff that, that gets put out there. At the moment it's a little bit, um, it's, a, it's very variable. Um, people are learning, you know, people are putting out cores which are very well verified, but it's not obvious that you can go and run that verification yourself. So I think that's a big issue. And, you know, things like continuous integration, there's a, there's a project I think being run at the moment as well where we're trying to get up a, a continuous integration service, something like we have a website, you go and point it at your IP and it, you package your IP with a certain bit of, you know, metadata and, and the continuous integration tool can go and unpack it, run it and then um, obtain metrics about how many tests are failing or passing or what it is you're testing and coverage and things like that. So there's, there's a couple of interesting ideas that, that we have at the moment that we'd like to implement. And so, starting though from the very beginning, we'd, we need to get this thing started. And we're at, there are only a few of us at the moment. There's probably only six, I think, six or seven in the foundation. And in, I can't remember when we launched. It would have been mainly, well, a main launch occurred last year at OICONF, which was in October. And since then, we've been very busy and uh, inundated with people who are very interested to help us and, and like the idea and, and see that we are trying to do open cores right. Um, but we need more people to help us. So um, if anyone's interested, please give us an email or come and talk to us uh, in IRC. And we're running the conference again in Bologna in Italy this year, in October. But uh, yeah, this is, this is definitely something that I think, if it's done right, will we'll have a positive impact on the community and the amount and quality of, of open source IP that's available for people to use. And uh, if you're interested or, or motivated to come and give us a hand with, with LibreCores or anything to do with the foundation, please give us an email or, or talk to me afterwards. So that's it. I'm happy to take questions.